those of you are having some really fruitful conversations here. Um, so as a group, you all, can you, what are some of the, the, the things that you're hoping to get out of this workshop and especially some of the hurdles that you face when, when you think about intercultural learning and study abroad? Um, what kind of came out of some, as important for us to bring up? Yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, I'm at Ashton Glasgow, I'm on the School of Public Health, and every summer I take a group of students to Cuba. And uh, they have been there for two years. Year I, I changed it and now it's Spanish is required because we are teaching the course in Cuba. We were offering, the, I always bought a part of TA who would translate basically there were lectures and also visit, lots of visits to different health facilities. And uh, I always think that it's, I always told students that if they knew Spanish, it would take more out of the program and that would be obvious. And because uh, they don't need to rely on someone else to do the translation. Well, I'm always surprised how many of them end up saying, oh, I wish they had known that knowing Spanish would have been helpful. That's one thing that shocks me. Um, and that's about the intercultural aspects. There's another one that shocks me, but it's okay if I mention it. So we are using graduate students. I spend most of the day with them. I have lunch with them. And I try to sit with different students try to meet all of them, and uh, the second week I've been taking them to a rural area, and we had lunch and dinner together, and uh, of course all the visits. Well, we are in Nevada, I have to uh, attend to administrative things sometimes, or meet with people, which is what has allowed me to continue to be able to go to Cuba for 20 years. You know, it's complicated to work there. And every, every time I say, well, you know, like, um, I'm going to go tomorrow at the beginning, and then I'm going to leave because I have to change the cash. There's no other way to get in Cuba than bringing cash. And I want to get rid of that cash as soon as possible, right? So it takes me hours. They don't understand. It takes me hours. Sometimes I have to go to multiple brands. You know that. They still complain that I wasn't there. I mean, and there are graduate students. We have program activities in the morning, we have lunch together, we have activities in the afternoons, and then I we part ways. I do my own stuff in the evenings. I think it's okay, right? But they always complain that I that I'm not more involved with them. I just I'm so they're ready to do that. Great, thank you. Not babies. Yeah. Great. Hopefully we can address that some today. Are there any other things that have come up that came up in your particular discussions? Of particular hurdles, yeah. This didn't come up because we didn't get to it, but I, I would say one of the biggest problems that we faced is that we take students for four weeks, and we're teaching two classes in four weeks. Get all the information in that you feel like they need to get to do well in the classes, and they want to travel, and they want to be with their friends, and they want to go out, and they want to sleep on occasion, and to, that's tough to do that. And one of the ways we on around is to give more assignments before and have some do afterwards, but it's still, that's the biggest challenge. And students, you just have to get them to think that from the very beginning. Great, yeah. Anything else that came out? Yeah. In, in this respect, uh, I find it amazing or shocking when students say, oh, if I have, would have wanted to take serious classes, I would have just taken on the campus. I thought, I thought, you know, this would be an easy way to get credit hours, credit hours. Right. And then they complain four weeks long because, yeah, they have to do their work and cannot go out at night. Yeah. Great. Anything else? So hopefully, yeah, go ahead. I think the, um, so the, I think major not compliance at a suggestion of a, um, we got from the over the years of running um, the chance Network program is that sometimes the um, the schedule unexpected schedule change might occur, particularly when you have a program have a lot of side visits, a lot of those kind of a um, a a, uh, a kind of service learning. Some things uh, you know could happen unexpectedly. Um, so I um, you know we kind of try to prepare our students saying that you know we send them the schedule 
but we, you know, we'll give them the kind of a daily update, um, so that we keep asking them to keep monitoring the, uh, the emails, and then make sure that they understand mm -hmm. what's going to happen the next day, morning, mm -hmm. afternoon, and at night. Uh, but we don't have enough issues about that. We their company about you know we're not with them you know at nights. So we're we always make us available, but, uh, <laughs> but it's not you know a, um, we're not kind of twenty four hours with them for sure. Yeah. Great. Great. So hopefully we'll touch on each of, of these topics a little bit and brainstorm some ideas um, because there are problems that we'll, we are constantly face in this. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you a little bit of research from the field um, of study abroad uh, about you know, intercultural learning and then um, we're going to look at some possible potential examples of ways that you might um, work intercultural learning into your pre, during, and post and then do some case study scenarios. So first of all, what, when we talk about intercultural learning, kind of the, the working definition of in, in study abroad is this. It's the ability to shift cultural perspectives, adapt or bridge, um, uh, thinking about cultural differences. And so um, this, you know, this is a term that's been worked through in anthropology um, for a very long time. Uh, and within study abroad, this, this is sort of uh, where we're trying to get our students. And we'll talk about this more moving forward. Um, but then as faculty members, why would, should we be doing this? Um, within uh, the university system, kind of internationalization to, to on various degrees has become a mandate of what we do at colleges. 79% of the AACU says that, that it's part of the learning outcomes uh, for the college and the university. And here, as part of, of our NTC mission, it says the college prepares students to be leaders and citizens who think and engage critically, imaginatively, and ethically with local, national, and global communities. And so as faculty members, when we think about this, you know, we are trained to talk about our subject material. But yet, um, this is part one of our mandates as, as faculty members. Um, but yet, to how, how do we think critically about doing this, both in our coursework on campus, but then also um, abroad? So um, to begin with, I want to just give you an overview of, of kind of the three dominant narratives that have happened in study abroad over the years. So the, the first narrative in th talking about study abroad, when we kind of begin study abroad as a field begins, it's the idea that when um, you experience or expose students to another culture, that is going to uh, equal growth in their intercultural development. So this, this comes out of the idea of the sort of the grand European tour, um, that you, you can go to Europe, you can visit the museums, you can see these elements of culture, and through this, you will, you will gain a sense of kind of cultural awareness. Um, and so, you know, this, this, as we know, you know, there has been much, much critiques across the, the board about what, what that means. If you can, is it enough, right, to just, to just take someone to another place show them you know the the tours um, and deal with this and you know even today though this is we think of it as kind of the beginning of study abroad when those of us dealing within the office of study abroad when our advisors are meeting with students this is oftentimes the grand majority of the the, the first dialogue that students have with us about the type of experience they want to have they want to go to europe they want to be able to travel frequently and see the main spots to check off of their list and so this is kind of the narrative that this is how you become cultured this is how you become you gain this intercultural understanding is through doing this so this was narrative number one narrative number two was this idea of well you know going to see the big museums and the important sites is not necessarily enough you need to really immerse yourself um, and it's this idea of you know language learning for example the the, the importance of kind of throwing yourself in completely, learning about the, the community. So um, getting involved with your neighborhood, getting involved to, of the local rhythms of where people and places are. Um, and this beca became what we think of when we think of JYA abroad. Um, many of us in, in this room kind of in the moments when, when study abroad was part of our educational experience, this was kind of uh, one of the, the models that was most often used, that you, you study abroad for a semester or a year, you go to a local University, uh, you immerse yourself in the culture. You figure it out. You figure out how to how to navigate different educational systems, different grading systems, different ways of interacting with professors. Um, and so, it's this idea: if you immerse yourself, you read up and gain knowledge of cultural difference, that you will have you will gain a new sense of intercultural learning. And there has been um, a lot of and so it's kind of this idea: of sink or swim, right? Throw yourself in. Throw yourself in and see. See what, see what happens. Um, 
And uh, there, there's been a lot of evidence that is sort of that, uh, around these two narratives. And for a, a long time, what we thought was, you know, we'd hear students come back and they say, I've, I've been transformed by this experience. I, this, this study abroad impacted me in a way that no other college experience has impacted me before. I, I learned so much. Um, but when we ask them to sort of deeply reflect about what is happening, um, the, the answers that we get kind of stay surface level. We start to see, well, you know, what, what is it actually that they, they were learning? That, that how, how are they articulating? Are they articulating it in a way that they are showing kind of this ability to adapt and perceive from another point of view, or are they still interpreting it through a particular lens? Um, so while the first sense that we had these kind of self-reported ways in which that first and second narrative um, was working, the field of study abroad started to kind of figure out ways to, to research and think about um, whether or not that, what, what students were saying that they were learning was actually happening. Um, and so a big study that happened that sort of challenged our thinking around this is the Georgetown Cons Consortium study of 2009. And in this study, um, they looked at a, a various range of study abroad programs and attempted to measure students' intercultural growth during a period of study. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the tool that, that it was used in the study and that in general is often used in terms of assessment and study abroad is called the Intercultural Development Inventory, the IDI, which I can talk to you all more about at length. And obviously, like any assessment tool, there, there are positives and, and negatives. But a couple of interesting things in, in the outcomes of measuring this was that they found that study abroad alone wasn't making a significant impact on students in their cultural gains. So going abroad wasn't necessarily uh, changing them in the, in the ways that students were articulating it. Um, and it also it discredited these assumptions about immersion practices. So they were looking at different models of study abroad. They were looking at the JYA study programs, for example, and they were seeing that that alone during study abroad, it was, it was chosen as kind of the most high impact practice that if students had some sort of mentorship, some sort of ways in which they're act, asked to reflect on and think about the importance of their experience, um, that that was one of the things that, that really uh, influenced it and impacted how students grew. Um, so one of the quotes from the article, a student is all too often in the vicinity of Shanghai without having a Shanghai experience. Um, and you know we we've all been there before, and uh, and, and thinking that that how, you know how do, how do you make that happen? How do you kind of shift the norm? Um, so a, a follow up to this study um, was done uh, in 2002-2014. Anderson, Lawrence, and White they started looking at short term faculty led programs, which in the field today. This is kind of becoming more and more the bread and butter as, as students are having more and more of a complicated um, schedule around majoring and double majoring and triple majoring and really thinking about, okay, short term, um, the numbers in short term programs studying abroad are, are uh, rising incrementally, whereas semester and year programs are staying about, about the same. So they were looking at the work that we do in short term faculty led, and they found a few interesting re results. They said, um, they looked at, in the 2012-2014, in the they were looking at 27 programs, and they found that um, students with no intercultural intervention on the program, so you just go abroad and kind of are teaching your courses abroad, but not thinking about the intercultural piece of the program, that they sh showed little growth in their intercultural growth, and some of them even regressed. So that sense that, you know, they're confronted with difference, they don't know what to do with it, and those stereotypes become reinforced even more because they don't have a, a, a moment to reflect on that. And then they repeated the same study in 2016 after, tr after training eight different instructor-led short-term programs where all the students and then all the faculty received pre-departure intercultural training. And 73% of the students made uh, significant gifts of, uh, shifts on this IDI assessment. Um, and 12% even made a stage game. And, and for, with the instrument, that's an actual, that's a, a very kind of statistically large increase of the way in which um, you're thinking about, about navigating different cultures. Um, so out of this, you know, if, if we think about our work and think about the, this, this idea that, okay, having frequent and having spontaneous moments where 
uh, has emerged as, as being very valuable for, for students to engage. Um, how are we thinking about adding this or incorporating this into the model of the programs that we create? We, we, we spend a lot of time as faculty members designing our course and thinking about our course. Um, and then how do we think about that course in new ways when we're abroad? And also, how do we think about that course in relationship to that whole program, right? And in terms of thinking about the classroom as not just the time that you're with your classroom um, students, but that the, time, that the, the experiential learning, the sort of in-class, out-of-class space, um, and, and training students in that ability to adapt in, in those, those, um, more, uh, those life situations. Um, how do we make that happen? Um, so this becomes the third narrative of study abroad that, that the field of study abroad is kind of grappling with right now, and we hope that you all will will think about and grapple with as you design your own program. So it's the idea that um, what becomes important in intercultural learning is both the cultural specific knowledge that, you're, that they're gaining in terms of the course that, that, they're, that, they're, that they're learning, so um, public health in Cuba or neuro, neuroscience in, in Stockholm, that that, that that becomes very important. But at, on top of that, the other piece is thinking, helping train students to think about the way that they're framing an experience. Uh, as being important. So it's not just an immersion alone, but an awareness of their own framing. So it's the framing piece becomes a type of facilitated learning. So the, the, the model of study abroad today is that um, immersion, immersive techniques with your students, coupled with active facilitated learning around culture, around thinking about perceptions of culture, um, equal intercultural learning. And so we don't see things as they are, we, we see things as we are. Uh, so understanding both kind of the self-reflection of self as it navigates different, uh, different experiences abroad. Um, so <coughs> as, as you all think about your, your, your courses and your programs, think about what, you know, what model does your program fall, fall into? And I think all, you know, the, where, where, where are ways that you might pick and choose and use different, different models, right? Because there's, there's no right or wrong way. But to having this understanding that the more that we can reflect and facilitate is important. Um, so going back to this understanding of intercultural learning, this ability to adapt, um, the ways in which it's kind of defined, what, what are the skills that we're trying to help have our students develop? One, um, in order to be able to perceive and understand these differences is to have this uh, sense of cultural self-awareness. So to be able to understand, um, we are responsible in ha helping our students understand what lenses they're bringing to interpret a location. Um, so that's, that's an important piece because before, if, especially for first time study abroaders, especially for, for students who haven't had, been, uh, had the experience to encounter difference as often, those things go un, unnoticed until they're challenged in new ways. So how are you thinking about and building into your experiences ways in which students become aware of the own, their own lens, where they view? Um, also, a deep understanding of the experiences of others in terms of their perceptions and values. So as we teach, how do we teach them to learn about where they are? Um, and then the, the, the value systems and beliefs, right? So, so we want, we want to think them to, to critically ana analyze that r rather than sort of like giving them, here is how you interpret place, right? You want, you want to give them the tools rather than tell them how it is. How do you facilitate that? Um, and then lastly, the very important piece of, of um, intercultural learning, and, and this also links heavily to safety and security issues, um, is the ability to manage their emotions when they're going through this. So, one of the main uh, things that the study abroad field is dealing with today is a, a higher rate of students with mental health issues while abroad. Uh, and so this, you know, we see this on campus, but this becomes even uh, more important while abroad. That it often becomes heightened in these moments of, of stress. And so part of our job also becomes how uh, in their intercultural training is, is how are you building in ways for them to manage our emotions? And these things are things that at first we might not think about as, as part of intercultural training to help a student understand how they're gonna navigate stress, but it becomes a piece of their ability to adapt interculturally. Um, so on that continuum that I talked about that in, in, in these assessments, 
there, uh, I, I'm just going to mention two kind of ways of thinking about this. Um, so someone that is in an intercultural mindset in the ways that we talk about in study abroad, very boiled down and simplified, is that they're able to, um, they, they help spend energy helping students conceptualize and facilitate these conversations. Um, and and they're, they're, this is on kind of that intercultural, they're, they're, they're able to adapt, they're able to make that bridge. Um, someone that's operating in what we call a minimization um, framework is talking about, often tries to be the cultural broker for students. And so in that stage, which uh, instead of kind of being able to make that bridge, what they're doing is they become like the, the interpreter of a situation. So this, this event happened, this cultural misunderstanding happened, I'm going to tell you what happened and help you kind of interpret what happened and, and instead of helping bridge um, a different way of thinking. So I'm not going to go into that too much, but just in thinking about how do we think about bridging versus how do we think about sort of creating ways where we're thinking about us and them or where we're saying all humanity is equal. You know, how do you get to those stages where you can talk about the nuance of difference? that you're talking about national differences, but then you're also talking about those nuances of, of different groups within that. Um, and how as faculty, you know, when you're thinking about place, how are you working through some of those things? Um, so more, more kind of research and thinking about uh, inter faculty led short term programs. Um, in 2001, this study came that said that um, on-site directors, when they were interviewed about studying abroad, they, they noted that they weren't asked to, to talk about intercultural learning, but yet they didn't really feel that, and it was one of their primary goals, but they didn't know how to do it effectively. They didn't they quite know what that meant. Um, and then another study by Good uh, explored that um, they often, the faculty often em emphasize, which becomes very important, this kind of the, the logistics role, right? Keeping our students safe, making sure we're, we're responding to them quickly when they need to go to the hospital or they break their leg or, you know, the, the kind of the things that come up, that that sort of dean of students, disciplinary issues that we constantly, we concentrate as that as faculty, but um, we underemphasize kind of the important role that we're thinking that we play in their intercultural development. Yet, when we think about it on an intellectual level, that's why we say we do what we do. But on the day-to-day, -day, there's kind of this disconnect. Sometimes. So, I'd like to, you guys to think for a second about your own programs. Um, and so when you do that, you know, thinking about the length of your program, the type of program that you run, thinking about kind of all of those different elements of intercultural learning, your ability to helping you think, uh, your ability to adapt, helping students gain self-knowledge, knowledge of other place, ability to manage emotions, um, relationships to courses. So if you're teaching a course on, I'm using you again, neuroscience in, in Stockholm, it's a course you teach on, on campus, and it's a set curriculum and you have to get through everything because they need to learn this. But what is the difference of doing it in New Orleans versus Stockholm? How are you thinking about that in different ways and getting students to think about that in different ways? Thinking about, you know, you're like, well, neuroscience, how can I build something into the curriculum that is site specific? Because I am dealing with this subject that seems disconnected. But how, what are ways, how do you think outside in ways that makes sense to do that? Um, and then, how are you building in pre, during, and post experiences? So if reflection is so important, and the learning doesn't end on the day that they leave, um, how are you building it into the end? How are you dealing with some of these issues that we brought up that happened in the beginning regarding, you know, need to know Spanish, or whatever those issues are? How do you, how are we building in the pre that are getting them to reflect? Um, and then the uh, one other one that is often, uh, we, f we forget about are the, are, are, the, are the difficulties that we deal with when our students are on really varying levels of their own intercultural development and readiness. So have a group of students, a few that really get it and really are able to engage while you have others that are not. And so how do you, how do you navigate each one of those to push them, to push them along? Um, 